Hi, hey, welcome to the Mindset Junkie Podcast. I am your host, Seamus Fox. I created this podcast to inspire people like you. People who want to create change in their lives, but possibly feel stuck. I love speaking with guests from all over the world who have created change in their own mindsets so that they can be the best and the highest version of themselves. They have greater impact on this world. So, strap yourself in and enjoy the Mindset Junkie journey. Hey guys, so welcome back to the Mindset Junkie podcast. Today's guest is Phil Graham. Phil, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, my man. Delighted to be here. Can't wait to share some insights and hopefully inspire a ton of people. Excellent. Phil, for the listeners and for people who don't know you, who are you? Where are you from? What are you involved in? I am 33 years of age from up the road, probably around about 80 or 90 miles from you. So yeah. not that far in a place called Hillsborough, which is just outside Belfast. I have been in the fitness industry for a very long period of time. A little bit of a, a backstory about how I got into the fitness industry and how I'm still in it. At 16 years of age, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. So I was literally told overnight that, hey, you're gonna die quicker you're likely going to get a health condition or some kind of complication if you don't manage this. And as a result of that, that was a huge turning point in my life. And I, I bring you back to the, the moment where I was diagnosed and how that sort of set the scene for everything that's happened over the last sort of 15 plus years. So I remember going to school one day on, on the bus and I remember looking out the window and I noticed that my eyesight was a little bit blurry. I was looking at the registration plates of cars and they were very blurry. And sometimes as humans, we're very good at observing differences and patterns that normally happen in our day-to-day -day life. And I thought, flip, my eyes are going blurry. I might need an eye test or something like that. And I was very, very young at the age. I was only like 15 or 16. Anyway, safe to say, I didn't have any value on health, fitness, nutrition. Uh, the school trip was straight to a local cafe where we would have got what's called an Ulster fry. I don't know if it's Northern Irish people listening here or American people, I don't know. But typically that consists of a pretty calorific concoction of bread, beans, uh, black pudding, uh, bacon, and a whole go of other goodness. Um, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Plus, I used to have a sugar with a series of uh, or not a, a tea with series of sugars in it afterwards. So I, I, we were on the way into school and I noticed this eyesight problem that had happened one day, the next day, the next day, and the next day. And I also started realizing I was going to the toilet a lot. And I said to my mom about it and she said, oh, it's probably some kind of viral thing. Long story short, it got to the point where I said again, and then we went to the doctors and within probably 25 minutes, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. Mom burst out crying. And at that age, I sort of sensed that something was wrong. And we marched up this corridor and I remember going into this sort of like dark olive green door kind of like cons consultation room with a diabetes specialist. And basically I was told inside that room that, hey, you might go blind. You possibly will do this. You, po you, you could have a chance of this and that. And it didn't really help when there was posters on the walls with diabetes is going to make you go blind and you're going to lose an arm. You're going to lose a foot or all this kind of stuff. So I was petrified at this young age, but the language that was used was might possibly could potential. There's a chance. I was young enough to realize, Hey, there's no absolutes here. There's no definites being said. And as a result of that, I then began to develop a bit of hope. So the topics of nutrition, exercise, medication, mindset, lifestyle were the key areas that the diabetes specialist individual had sort of said, hey, if you can master these areas, you're going to have a very, very good life. And back then, the only real role model I had was a guy called Steve Redgrave. I don't know if you remember who that was. He was, an, he was a, a, a roar for yeah. GB who had... Uh, diabetes and he was on the back of like shreddies and stuff like this so it was like the only reference I had of this like sports person that was on um, doing all this crazy stuff so it was from that moment forward where I really got a kick in the ass from the universe to go hey you need to look after your health so I literally devoured textbooks on nutrition exercise physiology uh, went and studied nutrition in university biochemistry I went to literally learn 
how I could prolong and improve the quality of my life. Yeah. And in acquiring that information, my dream was to become a dietitian um, in, in the health service. I fell in love with the gym, uh, started lifting weights and got into an environment where I eventually fell into competitive bodybuilding. I had a very successful junior bodybuilding career, went and competed all over the world, was in flex, was in muscle and fitness, competed and won various competitions in Ireland, universe, Mr. Britain. Long story short, I was able to achieve a lot of things that I was told I was never going to be able to. And that's because I had acquired the skill sets to be able to do that, the knowledge and the insight. And as a result of doing that, I was able to inspire others and they reached out to me for help with their physique and their health and fitness. And then that transitioned into a business. And then that transitioned into education for trainers. And then that transitioned into the development of the Diabetic Muscle and Fitness Guide, which you know, which is the world's first encyclopedia on muscle building for people with diabetes. And we created a very, very large community there of essentially individuals that never had any tools or education to build their physique or grow their bodies or do whatever they wanted to whilst being constrained with type one diabetes. So we had that. And then we evolved into coaching trainers and helping them grow their businesses. And now we run the world's largest fitness business mastermind in the world. Uh, we've got hundreds of clients from all over the place. And it's a pretty substantial business. And um, yeah, we help a lot of people all around the world. So that has all sort of evolved from being diagnosed with type one diabetes, taking action on the areas that I needed to improve and essentially finding meaning and purpose from it. So, you and know, like you, just as you said that full, like find the meaning, meaning and purpose from, it, because that can go either way for like any individual, like mm -hmm. one person might be diagnosed with the exact same thing. And all of a sudden think, fuck my life's over. I can't do this. I can't do that. Uh, and yep. it's way interpreted like, if you didn't have that early like upbringing or conditioning or, or what do you think it was for you in your own mindset at that time full of th thought, right? You know what? I'm going to find the answers. Yeah. Like for you in a different I suppose way. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go out easy. I didn't want to be a typical stat, stat and I wanted to basically be able to prove everybody else wrong in the sense of, Hey, I'm going to make the most out of this. I'm going to understand it and I'm going to learn it and I'm going to be able to control it. So I went and acquired the knowledge and then I tested it on myself and I, you know, from a bodybuilding perspective and everything that I, I've done in my fitness career and even my entrepreneurship, diabetes taught me about discipline. It taught me about tracking. It taught me about measurement, but I suppose I didn't want to, essentially, I didn't want to die young. I didn't want to end up with a complication and end up with a more difficult life. So I had a, a very strong reason in order to go after it. Now you could also argue why do so many people with diabetes with it being one of the most, you know, popular conditions in the world, not go after their health like that. And I suppose I didn't want to settle for a life of average and I didn't want to settle for excuses and it evolved and it spiraled. The minute that I started taking action, I acquired knowledge. I tested it. I was able to see the benefit of it. I was able to relate that to a lot of the experiences that I were around. So the implementation was giving me evidence that, hey, what you're doing is meaningful. And then people started to ask about, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? And then I had acquired enough information where I was in a position to guide them. And then I was able to turn that into a service. So it was this beautiful element of I was able to serve myself and I was also able to serve others. And it was this continuous like figure of eight loop back and forth. The more I was able to learn about myself and the more I was able to learn about the condition, the more I was able to give back and also as well, you know, scale that and relate that to, you know, other people in the world that were had related metabolic conditions. And I, I suppose, you know, it, it's this prime example of, you know, I'd been through the adversity. I'd learned how to get out of it. And now I wanted to go and advise others on how to do that. And I think from a business perspective, that's why a lot of people start service-based businesses because they experience a transformation themselves. They know what goes into it and they want to be able to share that gift with other people. And when you can turn that into a business where there's fair exchange, I'm going to help you do this and you pay for it, vice versa. It gives you a reason to grow. It gives you a reason to evolve and geek out on the area essentially to, you know, contribute and give it back. So essentially that that's, the, that's the overview. Yeah. hundred percent, man. And 
uh, that's right. Uh, like most people will, like their values kind of derive from their voids, the things that they felt that they had to overcome or the things that they experienced when they were younger. Yeah. Uh, you, like you perceive a certain void, you're going to turn that into value in some way or, or form within your business and your life in general as you start to grow and get older. So you mentioned yep. bodybuilding, Phil. Um, how, how did you get into bodybuilding? Who was the who was the inspiration in bodybuilding for you at that time in the North? Yep. You led you in that direction. Well, the bodybuilding was a vehicle for me to conduct my exercise. It, it just happened that I really enjoyed it. I love the aspect of lifting weights and coming from being overweight, out of shape and unhealthy and weak, I suppose strength training was the, the complete, you know, opposite of that. It would allow me to, to turn myself into, you know, when you're young at that age and you, you're growing up around action, man, you're growing up around, you know, figurines and action heroes and stuff like that. It was just this ultimate expression of how I could, you know, develop myself. And, you know, that, that journey was slow to start. And I suppose seeing other people and the transformations they were making in that environment around me inspired me to move on. But, you know, it definitely wasn't one of those things where it was quick to start. I had to, you know, make the mistakes. I had to build the discipline. I had to build the habits. And as you know, bodybuilding is a pretty full on in terms of inspiration. I mean, you know, you were surrounded about it that year, you know, movies, actors, figurines, all this kind of stuff. And especially from, you know, being overweight, and not be, and being afraid to take your top off to being able to know that, Hey, I can take my top off. Now I'm comfortable was a pretty big inspiration as well. So mm. yeah, you're, you're entirely right about, you know, relating back to, you know, voids and things like that. I suppose I had no regard for health, no regard for nutrition, just suddenly becoming completely, you know, not, not obsessed, but entirely focused on it mm. um, and, and knowing the benefits of it. And that's gone in swings and roundabouts. You know, I'm considerably older now. I, I don't compete competitively anymore. I train just for health. So I've gone through the whole extreme element of transformation to now letting it go again and sustaining it and building sustainability with it. And I think everybody goes through that when they first clock onto something that is going to give them benefit. They geek out on it massively. And then it's over time, they start to integrate that into their identity and their being. And then they're, they place a lot less importance on it because they built the awareness, the confidence and the skills that come with you know, conducting a behavior like that. So, yeah. What do you miss if you were to look back in the bodybuilding days? What do you miss? Because I know even when I competed and, and was kind of in the bodybuilding for a few years, there's certain aspects of that like environment that was addictive. Yep. And as you said, it's, it's transferable into business, et cetera, as well too. If you look back in those times training, is there a certain aspect of that that you miss or that you've took and carried on into your own life and in the business right now? I suppose sometimes the, the physical shape and appearance would sometimes uh, creep up and go, Hey, you know, you're, you know, 20 kilos lighter now. Um, that would sometimes come up or the actual physical strength. Um, in terms of the discipline and everything else, I've carried that over into other areas of my life now. Um, but there is a part of me that always looked forward to competitions and getting ready for it. But at the same time too, um, that devoured a huge amount of time and attention that essentially was not sustainable. And I think that every human being will at one point in their life be, you know, if they're geeking out in an area or completely inspired or all in, in an area, will come to the realization, how can I make this sustainable? And I think that's such an important factor. You know, um, I, I do miss the, the, the competitions, some of the size and stuff like that, but you know, I've, picked up what I needed from it, got what I needed from it. And I transformed that into other stuff and I carried it over. So, you know, I'm very grateful for that journey and, and the lessons that it taught me for sure. So when you started bodybuilding, Phil, was it a, a natural transition from there into you were coaching online, you were coaching in person, um, fat loss, general population. Yep. Yeah. Well, the back, back, now, back, back when I was bodybuilding, um, I was one of the first online coaches in the UK to start actually doing training programs and, stuff online with, with Skype and all this kind of old school stuff. Uh, we didn't have any true coach or any kind of platforms or anything like that to do this yeah. stuff. It was literally a word document. And, you know, uh, if you sent it to someone, you'd end up finding it was shared across everybody else. And I remember going into the gym and seeing like everybody with a, I was, I had a business back then called clear cut health and fitness and everybody had the same thing. And um, I mean, you know, 
the, 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 the world has transformed so much. Um, but I was basically taking my knowledge, my philosophies on how I felt somebody needed to follow to get in shape or build muscle and basically plug them into a service that I sold um, all over the world, you know, from a, from a very young, young age. Um, so, you know, the, the, the whole industry has grown so fast, you know, in the last 10 years, you know, online coaching now is a new norm online. Anything is a new norm because of the pandemic. And I think the pandemic really fast tracked the ability for online services and the acceptability of online services and online communication, you know, radically, you know, brought forward five, 10 years easy. Yeah, hundred percent. You spoke about the pandemic. Pandemic. I was going to ask you a question on it anyway, so I'll bring it up now. What has it taught you yourself, Phil, over the last eighteen months, personally and within business as well? too? what's the biggest lesson you've taken from it? Personally, I, I think it's, it's taught me quite a lot, business-wise, even more. In no particular order, business-wise, it's definitely taught me about the power of of community and the sense of belonging that people really want to have. I think that's one thing about the pandemic is it really made people want to um, sort of become involved in something or have a belonging in something. It highlighted a lot of concerns around people's time management and purpose and mission. Um, When you had so many people that were put out of work or told to work from home, you then entered into a whole range of challenges where people didn't know how to manage their time. And if you don't know how to manage your time, then you're going to fill it up with destructive behaviors, overthinking, et cetera, et cetera. It also gave birth to many new businesses. It destroyed other things, but at the same time too, you know, with the natural laws of build and destroy, it allowed a lot of people to reevaluate their life and put a pause on, you know, just what they were doing and made them really reflect what's important, what's not. Other things as well, you know, the news, newspapers, all that kind of stuff. I mean, if you were going through the pandemic, listening to that stuff, and you'd been put out of a nine to five and you were temporarily waiting to go back, it would have been a very challenging period if you hadn't been in that situation before. Um, So I really guarded, you know, my, essentially my inputs, what I was listening to every single day, who I was speaking to. um, And it was really one of those things where, you know, if you ran a business, you had to step up and you had to lead and you had to pivot. So the ability to adapt to adversity and the ability to change and being open to that change and um, I think as well, the realization that anything can happen and not to be complacent uh, with that. You know, I think, you know, we go back two and a half years, we started to hear of COVID and, uh, you know, like, like many others, I was sort of like, it'll never, it'll never evolve into anything. It's just some, something yeah. in China's kicked off. Everybody relax. Um, and then the next thing, you know, it's illegal to train. It's illegal to go to the gym. Um, you know, I, I, you know, you know, no, without going into conspiracy theories or anything like that. Do I understand fully what's happening? No, I don't think anybody does. Uh, do I trust what's going on in terms of vaccinations and all that? Um, I think they're doing the best that they can. And I think, you know, I'm not going to go into one of the vaccines and stuff because, you know, I was, I've had my vaccine, um, but, you know, I was out for dinner there another week ago and a guy was like, oh, you know, conspiracy theories and this and that and you know don't put that into your body and the same guy you know will go and do two lines in the toilet and tell me that you know you know don't take the vaccine so you know i think that a lot of people don't like being controlled i think that's the main thing but at the same time too you put yourself into the position that some of these individuals in government or world health organizations are and you've got biases misinformation and a ton of stuff. And I, I truly believe they're doing the best that they can. I do not know the agenda behind COVID, but I've got trust in my own ability. I've got trust in life. I've got trust in the flow of life and where it goes. And essentially, it's not where I'm focusing my energy on. Um, so I, I'm pretty much immune to a lot of the anger, a lot of the anguish that people have around this area. Um, I think it's one easy subject to get riled about and talk about, but I have a a vision and purpose of the things in my life that's far bigger and more interesting than when COVID. So I think that's probably a big thing Yeah, for a lot of people listening is to have something bigger than the challenges that you're facing in your life, uh, whether it's COVID or whatever like that. If you've got a vision b- bigger than that, you're not going to focus on that stuff. So, yeah. Oh, shit, man. And I think it, because it is so polarized, like it's to the extreme, you're either one way or the other. Mm. Uh, and last year I got sucked into a lot of it uh, myself. And just as you said there, it's it's one of the most important things. Like 
closing your mind off and like controlling your input, the things that are either going to serve you or, or don't serve you. Yep. And I've done a lot of work on it myself and around other areas and coaching other people as well too in the same thing. They create that balance and balance out those perceptions so that you yep. are in control and more objective. Yep. What, what have you seen in terms of the guys that you're coaching um, uh, within the fitness industry? Like You're going to get guys who are taking more action and being more successful no matter what's going on. Like What are the similar traits that you've maybe seen over the last 16 months, 18 months within COVID between those who are going and doing exactly that, that you're teaching, taking action and those who aren't, what, what's the difference there? Yeah. Well, a couple of things, I think, first of all, in terms of clients and implementation and people, this relates to any service, not just a fitness thing or a business thing. You're going to have a category of clients. You're going to have people that come in with big high hopes that want to do a ton of stuff, but don't take action. Uh, two, you're going to have people that come in and take aggressive action, achieve what they want, then realize, Hey, this isn't what I, what I wanted. And then tail spin out. And then you're going to get people that continue to take action and have got a vision and that are very aligned. The latter is very, very rare. So in terms of what I've noticed from a business perspective, one online services and online programs and online education and all this kind of stuff is far more acceptable and far more uh, desired than it ever has been before. Number two, in terms of selling in the face of this pandemic or whatever you may be, um, I mean, really, you've got to ask yourself, is there a viable need for what I sell? The answer is pretty much going to be yes, because you wouldn't create something that didn't solve a problem in the first place if you ran a business. And being comfortable selling that, no matter what the climate is. Um, you know, when you look at the pandemic, everything shut down, people were sitting in, social media usage went through the roof alcoholism went through the through the roof porn went through the, the roof all this kind of like high stimulus stuff went went crazy um drug consumption went up uh, domestic violence went up all of this kind of stuff so whether it's a mindset thing whether it's a business thing whether it's a fitness thing there is a huge marked increase in the demand for that stuff for people that have not got any kind of routine or regime or discipline or have an unexplored area of life that they want to turn into a business, there's a much greater need for that stuff. And there's more people that have that problem and challenge than, than most people think. So, you know, selling services and programs that are aligned with solving those problems, um, you know, is, is very, is very important. So I suppose the, the principle is, you know, continue to sell during a pandemic. Yeah, because even with people that I was coaching and um, there was a certain sense of apathy, I think, for a lot of people, like we're locked down, like there was a sense of apathy around their goals and the things that they had mm. planned. And there was also nearly a sense of guilt. I felt that for a lot of people that were afraid to say that they were doing well, afraid to say that they were being successful. Yep. And throughout history, this has always happened. People mm. have like done well in good times. People have done well in bad times. Yeah doesn't really matter but i definitely seen like within like my community anyway that there was a nearly a sense of people to say like feel afraid they were feeling afraid they actually said they were doing well during during the pandemic yeah and i mean i think that's an environment thing and you know you have to go in and you have to understand why that is the case people just don't want to be criticized um you know that that's essentially it and they don't want to be outcasted you know, when you're in an environment where you're only surrounded by people that are wanting to grow, wanting to build, you'll not hear that kind of language. Whereas when you're in a local community, whether it's a housing estate, whether it's a, a local community club or whatever, and you're surrounded or even your parents and you're, you know, you're coming into an environment where it's just solely focused on the problem, not focused on the solution and how you can get out of there. That becomes a very icky and sticky situation because you've built a relationship with these people over time. They're familiar, you know them. And to be outspoken is, is something where you're going to face criticism. And the reason why a lot of people don't do stuff is because they don't want to see the reaction or deal with the reaction uh, because it's unfamiliar. And, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're both from Northern Ireland where it's pretty, pretty much a, a very warped mindset around success, growth. Uh, money um you know you go to central london or you go to somewhere like new york or somewhere where there's you know significantly more um dare i say ambition but entrepreneurship or people wanting to make something of themselves nobody really cares um you know that they're, they're not going to have the time or you know even the energy to invest in, in bringing other people down and i think that's a huge thing 
especially in Northern Ireland. I mean, you know, the, the way I've always seen it, and I've, I've faced my fair share of criticism with close friends, even family throughout the course of the year, anybody that's been growing something has. But I think if you look at the evidence of, uh, you know, am I helping people? Am I changing lives? Am I getting paid for it consistently? Am I growing? Um, am I wanting to, you know, make this better and continue to provide a better service for my clients? If you've got those mindsets or that element of evidence in there, then, you know, a lot of people will make criticisms and try to pull people down with just binary thinking and not actually going, right, what are the actual facts behind what I'm saying? And when you actually realize the basis of it, you know, most people want to make themselves feel better by tearing somebody else down. And unfortunately, inside Northern Ireland and any, you know, I say Northern Ireland, this is pretty prevalent in every area of the world. Yeah. I mean, we can relate to Northern Ireland, but this happens everywhere. Yeah. You know, I think it's just a kind just, of, just sorry, what, go ahead. Just what you mentioned there, Phil, and I think it's really important as well is like any goal that you're setting or any goal that you're like looking to achieve, if you're not willing to pursue both pain and pleasure, it's not the right goal. It's a fantasy. And I think a lot of yeah. times people have that set up in their head that this goal is going to be all pleasure. This goal is going to be the fantasy is going to be all great when I get here or on the way, it's going to be fantastic as well. I yeah. think for yourself and myself and, and other people that I work with as well too, is getting to see the balance that no matter what you're going to try and achieve it. And if it is about goal and a big objective, you're going to get your criticism. You're going to get the pullbacks. You have to pursue both sides in order for you yeah. to get where you want to be. I always summarize it with, there is an optimal amount of hassle that comes with doing what you want to do. And that hassle, whether it's a few people making fun of you, whether it's a few clients canceling on you, whether it's a greater tax bill, whether, I don't know, whatever the challenge may be, that is part of the trade-off of having that. And to elude yourself of that is, is unrealistic. I, th I think it's just about being real. Um, you know, as you scale a business or as you grow, you will have, bigger challenges. You will have tax problems. You will have client problems. You will have, you know, shifts in technology or industry trends that you will have to contend with. Um, a pandemic, you will have, you will have challenges and essentially your ability to uh, develop beyond those challenges and, and work around them is essentially going to be the dictator of your success. Um, so that's why it's so important to be mindful of your environment be mindful of what you consume, both whether it's from food, right, the whole way through to sleep, news, people. And, you know, that requires you to make sacrifices at some point, you know, throughout your journey. But I suppose the, the most important underlying thing is one's belief in, and trust in themselves and their ability to carry through with that. And that does, you know, it's like training a muscle. It's like trying to lose weight. You know, think of how many people that want to do that and get caught up with the challenge of being invited out or going on a night out or whatever it may be. It's, yeah. it, it can be very similarly related. 100%, man. So I'll ask, instead of saying, what is success to you? Like, what is success not? So you, what is success gone, not to me? You've grown, you've done, you've, like you're growing, you've done fantastic over the last yeah. time, continuing to grow. What is success not? What have you perceived that it was going to be and it turned out not to be? I suppose if I was to give you a list of things, that's a great question. I suppose if I was to give you a list of things, uh, success is not how much money you have in the bank account. Success is not a certain model of car or, you know, size of house or whatever. I've had all of that stuff and have made a fair few pounds in my day. And I can tell you that the biggest marker of success is a couple of things. One, the conversation that goes on in between your own two years, 24 seven to the ability to love and trust yourself when challenges come courage. And also the fact that nobody can buy your time. I think those are, are great markers of, of success. Um, you know, everybody looks at, you know, the materialistic outcome that is associated with building wealth, but they don't comprehend the challenges that come with managing wealth. I think, you know, one thing you got to be mindful of is when you have more wealth, more resources than you actually need, you have a lot more stuff to manage. And when you have a lot more stuff to manage, you have a lot more challenges and problems that can happen. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that one should not pursue that. I mean, wealth is a byproduct of simply creating something great, systemizing it and growing. And um, so you cannot, you can't hide from that. 
Um, but you know, when you've got uh, a ton of variables that you have to manage on a day by day basis, um, every human being is a certain threshold for what they need. And I think one of the most important principles that I can share and having helped a lot of people achieve financial freedom in their life. And I've helped a lot of people do that over the years is getting the goalposts to actually stop moving and having the confidence and trust in yourself to know that you're going to be okay. And you're going to be safe when you don't have to keep going after the next thing, because with entrepreneurs, there's this dogma of always chasing more is better, bigger, better. I'm going to grow. But that paradox is where is all of this coming from? Why do you want to be better? Why do you want to make more money, et cetera, et cetera. When that is a sole focus, it's coming from a place of lack and a place of fear and a place of, I want to be safe. Whereas when you can approach life, and this is the punchline, when you can approach life with the trust in yourself and the love in yourself that I can take it or I can leave it, that's where true power reigns. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of self-work to be able to get to that place. And, you know, a big spiritual goal of mine was to get very, very wealthy. And I got there, I achieved that. And you have to go there to, you have to, get, you have to, first of all, not have it to know what it feels like with lack. Then you have to go there to have it. And the best place is living in the middle to know that you can live with it or live without it. Not at um, you know, that is a, the, probably the biggest lesson that I could share with you. Um, because if you look at, you know, the evidence is peppered all over the world. I mean, look at the serious amount of people that, make an enormous amount of wealth and end up killing themselves. Look at the amount of people that make an enormous amount of wealth and then lose it. I mean, you know, we're in a, a world now where, you know, somebody puts you up, uh, you know, a picture of their finance car and a Gucci belt and they're considered wealthy. And the expectation of success is so far-fetched and warped. It's not that difficult to do that. You know, you're not filling anyone in a Gucci belt, right? So, you know, for me, true wealth is really that conversation I have with myself, my, my self-love, my ability to take it or leave it, control my time um, to, you know, to, to, to really just trust and love myself. That's, that's really where true wealth is because from that vehicle, from that identity, that's wherever you're going to be able to express yourself without worry about being criticized or whatever like that, you know? Um, and that, that, that takes a, that takes a good bit of work to get there. Um yeah. Uh, so yeah it's nearly like and it is hard it's coming from that place of like non-attachment and as you said like your spiritual path and your spiritual goal was uh, to get to get wealthy yeah and there's nearly a conflict of interest there a lot of the times for a lot of people as well too in terms of spirituality they think a spiritual path is to like sit in a lotus position and meditate all day and, and not pursue something but I like linking it to what actually gives you inspiration. Your spiritual path mm. is what you're inspired to do every single day and what you love to do every single day. And for you and me and other coaches and entrepreneurs, that's serving people and helping people and coaching people. So why not get the, the benefits from that in terms of the financial gain, et cetera, from doing something that you're inspired by and, and what you actually love? Yeah. And, you know, a, a good proportion of that finance is put back into how can I serve more people and how can I create, you know, the systems or the team to, to be able to refine that. And, you know, that essentially is, you know, for me to, to do what I love, to get paid for it. Um, and at the same time too, to not place in a huge importance on, on wealth, whilst money is very important. Yeah. I'm a firm believer in that. Um, it's certainly not the only goal. I mean, you know, when you look at the areas of life, financial, you know, business, spiritual, physical, social, all of these different categories of life. I mean, financial is only one area of it. So, you know, spiritual, most people don't really know what spiritual is. And, you know, some people will feel that that's a religion for them and that's their purpose. That's their quest. Some people will feel it's a philanthropic thing. Some people will feel it's a business venture. You know, th th there's so many different ways that one can express that. And, you know, f for me, I suppose I, I deal with a lot of, uh, I deal with a lot of business owners that come to me and want to, to make a lot of money. And one of the deeper rooted sort of something that I don't really talk about a lot is the, the deeper rooted spiritual mission of what I do is to get them to a point where they realize, Hey, I don't need to worry about money now, because I know that once I've hit it, this is what it really is like. And it's not all it's cracked up to be. 
Yeah. And then they be can begin the true work on themselves. And that's whenever you really see the wealth develop, you know, they make better decisions. They're, 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 you know, they're not panicking about money because money is such a huge anchor for so many people. And, you know, I never came from a, I came from a bang middle-class family. So I was always brought up on that. You didn't know you were rich. You didn't know you were poor. And it's actually quite a weird place to be. Um, whereas sometimes when you're brought up in a, you know, a sort of more poverty struck in environment, there tends to be that feel that want to go after stuff where the middle-class kind of thing is like, do I settle? Do I not? Do I settle? Do I not? And it's a very weird difference. And then you've got obviously people that are born into money where they don't feel they need to push. So yeah. you can see like the, you know, the, the, the bottom and the middle are quite interesting places to be. Um, you know, and like I said, I've seen, you know, all walks of life, you know, I'm 33 years of age now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for what I do, but money is not the main driver for that. Super important, but not the main driver, if at all. Yeah. Um, and, and as you said at the start, Phil, that's like tying into something like a bigger vision and a, budget, a bigger mission than yourself a lot of the times in order for that to happen. What, yeah. what do you wish you had started sooner within your business? What do you, if you look back over the last maybe five, six years, even longer, what do you wish you had to start sooner in your business so that you could have maybe catapulted that growth? Probably after? Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, honestly, um, I got asked this question the other the other week at a at a conference. It was my first conference. I was back speaking at, and you know that the same sort of question is: Do you have any regrets? Would you change anything? And the answer is no. Um, the reason why is because I had to go through everything that I've had to gone through in order to evolve and develop. And I'm at a period in my life now where I wouldn't change a thing. And for me to go back and say, I would do this earlier, or I would do that earlier, or this and that would be, you know, disrespectful and discerning of what, what I have right now. And, you know, essentially that I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, so you know, I, I believe everything that I've done in life, whether correct or incorrect in the context of what I've wanted as a goal has always taught me to evolve or to pivot or to change or to go and relearn and stuff like that. Um, I suppose, you know, again, further sort of advice for any entrepreneurs or anything listening, you talked about vision there. I think one of the biggest challenges people face is not necessarily the, the challenge of others, but it's a challenge in themselves to stay aligned to that. Um, it's, it's, it's always making sure you're aligned with the vision. Um, one thing that I do periodically is always checking in. Why am I doing this? Am I still enjoying this? Um, where is this leading to? And just basically really making sure that I'm aligned with what I'm doing. And in the grand scheme of you know, is there any area of it that wants to change? Because, you know, building a great business or doing, you know, something very meaningful and having real impact with it is actually quite a boring, um, a, a boring sort of day to day of conducting same stuff over and over again. That's essentially what makes one grit. Uh, I think we're in such in an environment now where there's so much distraction and people think they need to be doing 101 things. They need to have a side hustle. They need to you know, be making passive income through this or doing Bitcoin on top of their business and all, all like a ton of loads of stuff. And you, when you look at it all, like they're very scattered, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so it's really just about, you know, making sure that your energy and your focus is going into the right areas of the business. And then, you know, when you eventually build a team and build a stable, how can I put it, machine almost, mm -hmm. then you can start looking at other areas or ventures. But I think most people quit way too soon. Um, because they just don't have the resilience to put up with the boring stuff because, you know, it's like you look back to when it came to building a great physique, what did you have to focus on? Calories, progressive overload, physical activity, taking your measurements, eating whole foods, all that, you know, there was, you know, not jumping between keto diets and alkaline water and, you know, this supplement, that supplement. This yeah. training method, Basics. that training method, it's the boring stuff that's done repetitively that essentially gets a result. Yeah, 100%. There's a great book called uh, The Slight, Slight of Mouth, and it talks about that, and um, it talks about what success really is, and it's a mundane, yep. boring shit that yep. people don't perceive. It's showing up and doing the emails, it's doing the posts, it's being consistent with all the boring yep. stuff. People want the flashy thing, or they perceive that as the success, but yep. not that at all. 
the the consistency bit isn't the thing that sells or isn't the thing that's marketable. Um, and don't get me wrong, you can certainly hide out a client success or a personal success and hook people in to let them know what's possible if you are consistent. Um, but at the same time too, it's not, uh, you know, the advice be consistent isn't really that lucrative, you know? So uh, nobody wants to hear that stuff, but that's the truth. Yeah, 100%. So what has shifted for you then since um, Penelope has come along? How has that shifted you? And uh, yeah, so, yeah, so for, for con- yeah, so for context, I had a girl, a baby girl, about six, six and a half months ago. Uh, she's developing a character now, the personality, which is amazing to see. Um, a lot of people have asked me what has changed for me. Um, and, you know, in, in all honesty, she's definitely allowed me to appreciate and love life even more than I had. I'm not going to say that it's, it's in, encouraged me to manage my time better or, you know, anything like that. Cause I, I always did manage my time very well. I suppose it has made me, it's, it's, I was not a family person. I was not a family guy. Um, it has definitely made me realize that we're all functioning as a unit in, in terms of our vision for life. And that's again, another key piece of information that I could, you know, share with all of you guys, if you're in a relationship or you've got a partner or a husband or wife or whatever it may be, that the most important factor in that relationship is a shared vision of where you're going together. Because when you have that shared vision, you can then put up with the day-to-day of challenges, bad habits, behaviors, whatever, when you go a separate way and you want one thing and they want something else, that's when you're fucked. So you've got to, you know, me and Claire have a periodic practice every single week we check in with each other um you know what are our wins for the week what were our challenges um is there anything i need to apologize for um where do you need more help what are your focuses this week so we always make sure that we're aligned and that that takes a ton of discipline to sit down and do that you know on a sunday afternoon when you don't feel like it it's got to be done but from our relationship it's you know i've been you know with claire and i 13 years been married like 11 of those Mm. Um, so, you know, it's been, um, you know, I've held it together pretty young. Um, so, you know, essentially that's, that's important. Yeah. Um, as you said, like for a lot of time, I know for me that when my daughter was born, there was a lot of things kind of shifted for me in terms of, right. There was a lot of stuff that had to change in my life at that time and taking on more responsibility. You realize then that it's not all just about you. Yep. And it's not just your uh, needs that need to be served and your needs that need to be coming first. So a lot changed for me at that time and it changed in a positive way because at that time I kind of wasn't a destructive path and wasn't doing the things that I'm doing now. So I got a massive lift from that in terms of my daughter being born and that responsibility that I had to take on board. Um, so I learned a lot of lessons from that, 100%. So for, for you, you feel that it's you're still kind of focused in the same areas. What about- Yeah, the- still, still, still focused, I think it's definitely brought me closer to family. Um, I suppose like, you know, I I always operated, you know, when me and Claire were together, even before Penelope was here, like, Hey, this is all for us. And she's Penelope's now included in the us. So I already had that sort of pre-built in kind of responsibility, I suppose. Um, But I think, you know, it's definitely made me like, you know, as a sort of like really just hardcore entrepreneur, I think, I struggled sometimes to not have the, the outlets or pockets that were family related. Yeah. And then, you know, you know, finishing a day and coming home to your daughter and she's got a wee smirk on her face and all this kind of like personality stuff is very warming to my heart. It's something I've never experienced before. And it's definitely like a little pocket for me to enjoy that I, that I didn't have before. And that, like I said, it's brought me an appreciation and, you know, wonder about, you know, life. And, you know, I think as well, you know, for me, I definitely want to, uh, you know, as I say, upgrade the lineage of our family. I want to be able to, you know, bring that child up with a lot of the areas that I would have loved to have been taught in. And that's no disrespect to my parents. That's realizing that my parents only had the resources and the upbringing that they had to do their best. And beyond that, they couldn't. So sometimes, you know, as, as you know, we're in a different age, we're in a different time frame now, we're consuming more information that wasn't available at that time per se and sometimes you know I I find myself going I wish my parents would have brought me up with that I had a an element of shame and a bit of like you know anger towards them for not bringing me up with you know 
yeah. newfound principles. And I realized, you know, hey, my parents only had an upbringing and it was a lot tighter and a lot stricter and a lot more religious orientated than, than what I have now. So I can give back. And, you know, I, I lived through, you know, again, in Northern Ireland, very sort of like, you know, Protestant Catholic. I grew up in a very religious um, household. Yeah. So, you know, I was brought up to be told that a lot of things were right. A lot of things were wrong. A lot of things were sin. A lot of things, you know, heaven, hell, and just very just straight down the middle kind of like, you know, Bible thrown at you kind of thing. So, you know, that, that, that was, um, you know, that had a huge impact on how I saw the world for sure. Um, yeah. And I had to go and, you know, do my own research in order to it's, it's transcend funny. all that. It's funny when you look at that, cause I, I've looked at that myself and I remember for a, a long period of time, kind of like being in that victim mode and thinking I didn't have mm. the ex growing up. Yep. I came from unemployed parents, council house, et cetera. Yep. But those were the voids that actually drove me then to do the things and achieve the things that I'm looking to achieve. So yep. sometimes you look back at those and you're like, well, if I did have exactly everything that I perceived that I wanted, would I be doing exactly what I'm doing right now? Would I be the person no. I am right now? Probably not. Yeah, 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 100%. And it's the same, you know, I was brought up in this environment of, you know, you had to do this in order to have a fulfilling life. And it was very very um it was, it was like an entrapment nearly you know if you weren't going to live this way you were destined to go to hell or you were destined to you know be a sinner and yeah. that was you you were going to burn forever and you know when you're young and you're you know being told that you're gonna you know you know you, you're gonna burn in hell for a long period of time right you know <laughs> it's uh this sunday you're burning hell <laughs> yeah so you know <laughs> you, but that was a that was the thing for a lot a lot of people. Uh, yeah, and I, I suppose I I was brought up being controlled, and I wanted to develop my independence, and I just overshot the fucking thing. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it is for people listening. On like there was a lot of that here, a hundred percent. There still is, to be fair. Oh, but- there still is. I mean, you can still, you know, I think you know, you're brought up, you're either Protestant or you're either Catholic and you were fed a narrative. And that narrative was something that, you know, was always on your mind. Are they Protestant or the Catholic? You know, the, the, you know, I mean, I don't care. And I, you know, my wife, she's Catholic, I'm Protestant. Um, and, you know, that, that was a major, that brought a major challenge into the family at, at that point in time, you know, when I was, you know, in 2021 and expressed that. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, I mean, there was there's a lot of stigma and a lot of stuff attached with sort of Northern Ireland culture, which is understandable because during that period of time where, you know, I certainly wasn't around, yeah. you know, they had family members that were involved and, you know, that were possibly killed or marm, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Um, you know, so yeah, I have to, have to understand where they were coming from in their application of that. Yeah, thankfully it's moved on a lot since then. Uh, yep. So Phil, if you were to look back at that 15 year old who was scared and being diagnosed and you could give him like a, a phrase or a word or a message, what would it have been or what would it be? I suppose the words would be, I love you and I trust you as simple as that. Um, you know, I, I, I tend not to worry about challenges and problems now. Cause I, I go into perspective of, you know, realizing that, if I was to look back at any younger age in my life right now and say something, it's always going to have the theme of those words. Mm. Um, and when I know that my higher self is guiding me to, to make good decisions and make authentic decisions and stuff like that, I, you know, I don't really have challenges in life. You know, I'm sitting talking to you here on a thousand pound computer with a very expensive microphone. You know, I'm not, you know, in Afghanistan holding onto a plane, yeah. you know, trying to fly out of the country. <laughs> Right. You know, the, whatever was going through that guy's head to jump on a plane and while it was taken off. I mean, you know, I think that's one thing, you know, we all need to realize or anybody that's listening to this right now who maybe doesn't have a job or is overthinking things. You're probably listening on a thousand pound iPhone, um, you know, and realize that you don't have problems. You know, there's not bullets flying over your head. Your kids haven't just been killed or assassinated, you know. Sure. There really is understanding that most people listening to this are just simply managing challenges and stress on a dichotomy scale mm. versus actually having problems. Um, and remember, everything is workable. 
you know, everything is, you know, you can work your way out of anything. All it takes is courage, the right people, um, and, and, and simply just implement action, you yeah. know? So, yeah. Hundred percent, man. Phil, if people are looking to make contact with you, if they're looking and they're interested in coaching or being part of the program, etc., where's the best place to find you? If you just go to phildicegram.com, all the details are there. Look me up on Instagram. Not not hard to find. <laughs> Pretty easy. So yeah, Seamus, thank you so much for taking the time to to do these. I know how much time these can take to put together and chop and edit. So yeah, I appreciate you for doing this, and um, appreciate you I know for your audience too as well. Yeah, definitely. Good to chat again, man. Yes, my man. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Excellent. Speak soon. See you, mate.